Well, hello there. I think we are live and recording. Hello. Good morning. Um, well, good morning. Um, and Natalia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, maybe maybe the best way to begin, since we're doing this as a Skype video, is um, for you to introduce yourself and tell me a little bit and tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background and, um, and your areas of research. Yes, so my name is Natalia Melman Petrozella. I'm an associate professor of history at the New School in New York City. Um, I am a scholar of contemporary American politics, culture, society. I wrote one book. book tentatively entitled Fit Nation, How America Embraced Exercise as the Government Abandoned It. And the idea there is to tell the story about the way that working out has become a national obsession, not necessarily one that we all do, but it's an idea with which I would say we are pretty much uniformly infatuated with. Um, but that as the esteem of exercise has risen in our culture, it's pretty much become a consumer product, not a right of citizenship. And and so I think it's very much in line with the themes of consuming happiness to talk about the way that fitness has become not just a virtue, but one for purchase. Yeah. So, I mean, so the, the, the we, I do really feel like we're getting sold a culture of exercise and sold a culture of well-being. And really the idea is that you can't be happy unless you are skinny and fit and um, or and not even just skinny, that you have to be really fit, go to CrossFit, go to yoga, and that in fact, if you don't do these things, um, not only can you not be happy, but there's an element that you failed somehow. So really, it seems like a pressure cooker element. How did we get here? Can you tell us a little bit about the history of sort of how we got here um, to this idea of exercise as a consumer product that is so central to our happiness? For, for sure. So sit back, kids, because this is a long story. <laughs> I'll try and give you just the general parameters, and then we can kind of go deeper. But um, yeah, that's basically the frame of my book, how we got here. And not in terms of the for purchase part, but in terms of the idea about how fitness has become this like celebrated virtue. But also, you're very right, Christine, something that if you don't purchase, it's not just you're great if you run marathons, but oh, you don't go to yoga? you know, you don't go to CrossFit, like, oh, you must be lazy, right? So associating exercise with a kind of whole range of attitudes that um, if you do them, you're positive. If you don't, you're not. Um, okay. So the first thing to realize is that working out, if you were not an athlete, was an incredibly strange pursuit for definitely most of American history, but certainly until about the 1950s or 60s. And you, there are a variety of reasons for that. But one thing that I think is really important to realize is that until industrialization made kind of rich caloric food and desk work, the norms, not for everybody, but for a lot of Americans, displaying a body that looked like you could, one, afford caloric food and to leisure was actually a positive. And in the book, in the first um, chapter, one of the most funny, fun sources that I have are these like fat men's clubs, which you can imagine existing today. And that would be a sort of like, you know, you have to, wait, did you mute yourself by the way? Nope. I can't hear you anymore. Oh, now I can, okay, cool. No, I didn't. Um, I'm just sort of like laughing silently yeah. about fat men's clubs, but I want to know more. <laughs> yeah, but in the late 19th century, these fat men's clubs were actually like exclusive societies. And the criticism that they got when they would go somewhere for their annual meeting was that they were exclusive and that everybody should have, like the sort of long suffering skinny waif should have the opportunity to hang out with such fun people because fat people are jovial and they're generous and they're nice and they're well off and they're a better sort. And like, you know, that was not exactly a national fixation, but it's certainly like that is not a cultural association we can imagine today. Anyway, so industrialization happens late 19th, early 20th century. And you start to see um, a preoccupation with the clerk, which is which were men that worked in offices with desk diseases. And um, desk diseases were considered like, you know, the sloping shoulders, the paunch, circulatory issues. And so you definitely see what I see as a kind of prehistory to the era that we're in today, where there's like a kind of fledgling cottage industry of um, gymnasiums with Indian clubs and kind of different different things. 
that and and what there also is at this period is there is a rather popular subculture of strong men and even strong women and this is like um if you ever go to a gym with kind of retro decor you might see a guy like eugene sandow posing on stage often dressed in a greek god outfit and these were like in circuses in um the world's fair and kind of other traveling reviews these were people often who came from europe by the way who were um billed as quote unquote living statues having perfect physiques. And um, they were people who promoted a kind of like Fitzbo lifestyle in the early 20th century. Now, I want to pause there because there are people who I think don't honestly look deep enough into this moment and are like, see, those were the first Fitfluencers, like, you know, so inspiring. But here's the thing, those people in that era, they were performing fitness in a way that was not about look like me. It was like, look at that almost freak of nature. Like when they were on stages within the circus, they were with bearded ladies and Siamese twins. And like the idea someone would not only lift a lot of weight, but want to lift a lot of weight was seen as exotic and like maybe sexy and a oh my god look i want to touch the the muscular person but it was not really seen as positive unless you see like major exoticization as positive anyway that starts to change. And I say that that starts to change in the post-World War II period for two main reasons, um, a variety of them. But one is this prosperity becomes more widespread. So there's a wider um, kind of fear about um, sedentary life that happens during suburbanization. And I should say mo most of these fears almost until the Obama era, are about the lack of fitness among white middle class people. No one cares all too much about the hardiness or the fitness of people of color and working class people. Um, OK, so that happens. So you have this wider spread of prosperity, which breeds more leisure and breeds, breeds more sedentariness at the same time. And this is the like big intellectual shift that I chart is I think you have two main ideas which gain a lot of currency throughout our culture. One is that mind and body are connected. And so that to have a fully actualized self, there's no way you can do that without tending to your body as much as tending to your mind. That is a big. Oh, let me tell you the second idea, then I'll go back and explain it. Um, so that. And then the second one is that as an individual, you have the right and the responsibility to take care of your own health. And to do anything less is kind of an abdication of your um, responsibilities as an American and as a human being. So let me, neither of those are born in like 1955, for sure not. You can trace them to the Greeks even or to many Western cultures. But I will say that they um, gain a lot more currency in that period, starting with the first one that mind and body are connected. You know, that might seem like people always believe that. Why would you why would you think that that is a new thing? Actually, if you look, hold on one second, I have a heater on behind me. I want to turn off. It's making noise. Um, if you uh, if you look at like the physical education activists of the 1950s who are responding to what some of them call the tyranny of the wheel, kids are in strollers, they're in cars, they're not getting fit, men are going on, on trains to work. One of the biggest things that they contend against when trying to get federal funds for um, physical education or even trying or even for adult recreation is the idea that people who focus on fitness and exercise will become muscle bound. Muscle bound doesn't just mean you look super jacked. It means that your mind and your kind of higher qualities of self will become imprisoned by your muscles. Like the idea that you would spend your time working on your body is seen as antithetical to working on your mind. And so it's actually really fascinating when you see like, um, these discussions among these activists in the 50s and 60s that all these like phys ed people who come out of JFK and Eisenhower, they're cold warriors. They're like, we need to be fit to fight, basically. But there's this whole other strand of cold warriors who are like, what are you talking about? You're going to turn our kids into a bunch of like muscle bound idiots who are not equipped to fight a war that relies on kind of like scientific knowledge and intellect, et cetera. So that's one thing. And then the second thing, um, that I want. And so that changes. And we can talk about after how it changes because I want to lecture. But um, the second one about individualism, that is super interesting, too. As you might imagine, having studied these themes in your course, um, that notion that individual and personal responsibility is everything is very popular and appealing among sort of 
generally conservative or even like mainstream liberal people. What starts to happen in the 1960s and 70s is actually women in particular, but I would say lots of other marginalized communities embrace that notion of taking responsibility for your health as a form of self-determination, often in resistance to dominant ideas about the body. So women who have been told, oh, like you don't know what your body needs. Oh, you, you know, you should use formula. Your breast milk's not good enough. Or, you know, you're actually weak. You can't do sports. These women start to use fitness as a form of resistance to that. And you see that in African-American communities who have a very fraught relationship with expertise, et cetera. So I could go on and on and on. But to me, those two ideas, mind and body are connected. And so you must cultivate the body to be a fully actualized self. And two, it is up to individuals to take responsibility for those for their health. Um, those converge in the post-war period and really pick up speed, I would say, throughout the late 20th century to get us to where we are today, where those are like pillars of virtue, I think, across the political spectrum. And I think those that's the intellectual foundation that gives rise to the fitness industry as we know it today. And it's also those ideas, I think, are so deeply held that um, the marketing of the fitness industry fits right into that, right? Like, um, oh, like you're not being your best self if you're not working out too, right? And so I'll pause there, but those that's like the, the grand scope of things. And this fits so nicely with um, what we talked about with the therapeutic gospel, right? Oh, you know, yeah. Moscow does work, right? I yep. mean, this idea that we have these 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 central tenets that we don't question anymore right. about about uh, that, that you know that we all have problems, but we should talk about them, and that that um, and that they are our individual issues. It seems like this is really an embodiment, quite literally, of that therapeutic gospel. Totally. And in my chapter on the 50s, I cite that book, which I know your students read, saying that, like, yeah, this is part of a larger intellectual moment that's prizing individualism and work on the self in a broader sense. And I think it's really interesting to see. I'm so interested in the way that plays out across communities of different political sensibilities. Right. Like, you know, this is both about like self-actualization in a cruel world that's racist and misogynist and all of that. But it's also ooh, sorry, it's something the up call came in <laughs> um decline um but it is also about um uh, but but it's also about sorry I like totally lost my turn of that but it's also about sort of like enshrining the individual as like the ultimate right. Fight for everything good. <laughs> but so so okay. But this is interesting because you had it actually a much more positive spin on it than I was expecting. Um, the idea that this was sort of marginalized communities uh, take having an empowerment role to yeah. kind of be stronger and with their body. Because now, of course, from the perspective that that I, I see it in in modern times, it's it's the opposite. It's about telling women often that they're that they're not enough, that they have to look a particular way. Or am I seeing it through an overly negative lens? So tell me a little bit about like. A what? feminist killjoy, Christine Wheeler. I'm killjoy. Kill okay, go ahead. Okay. Tell me. Be, be optimistic. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, um, yes and no is what I would say. And I hate being a historian who like only complicates and walks away because our role is to clarify. But here's the thing. If you look at the kind of like proto women's fitness businesses of the 1950s or even like the 1920s, because there were kind of the, the seeds of this. I mean, that's what I call disempowering. These places were called reducing salons, yeah. slenderizing salons. Oh, you can actually see, because you guys are going to see video. Look at this sign for one, slenderizing, right? This is from the early 1960s, which uh -huh. changed then be for health, which is like a transition in the period of what they were selling. But early on, these places were, they were all about weight loss and they were all attached to beauty salons. And so the notion was like, the reason that you're going here is to get smaller and to get prettier. There was no presumption. And by the way, they all advertise you don't have to do any work. You can keep your heels on. You just sit in a chair because to be a respectable lady was not to exert yourself or to sweat. Like athleticism was not appropriate. Now, we still see strands of that today. And sometimes I even think, to your point, it is resurgent when I see places like the quote unquote face gym, which is like a workout for the muscles of your face. I kid you not, LA, New York, and London. Um, or the your <laughs> workout. Um, to me, that has echoes of the gym as purely about beauty and salons. That being said, let's not underestimate the fact, I'm sticking with the women's example here, that for women to take 
time for themselves to do rigorous exercise, to be together, to start businesses, to spend their own money. All of that, I actually think, is a very important aspect of a kind of more genuinely empowering side of women's fitness. And I should say, and I'm like, deeply divided about this because I see the powerful trends of both of these. One of something I wrote about in the Atlantic earlier this year, because it was about jazzercise, which was started in 1969. To me, that is such an example of a place or a business or a trend really where these tensions like coexist. On the one hand, the reason that the founder um, created it, she had been a trained dancer, is because she would see all these moms sitting on the side while their daughters took dance class and they'd be like, oh, who am I to dance? Oh, no, I would never do that. Or like, that's too scary for me. Or that's too, I, I, I'm i like too in my own head about it. And so she created this workout class effectively where you turn the, there are no mirrors in jazzercise then or now. It's simple choreography. It's women coming together. 99% of her franchisees are women. Like there's a really interesting thing. On the other hand, she's thin and white and blonde and like has also been perpetuating in certain ways these ideals that, um, you know, I think still are very much with us. But I wouldn't say are the only thing driving um, fitness today. Okay. So we talked a lot about women. What about men? Because I feel like. Uh, so often the men get lost in this, and yet um, there is an equally interesting story about body image and men and the Adonis complex. And um, so, yes. Okay, so di- different books. narrative, different narrative about men here. Um, so when I said like working out used to be strange, right? So right. on the one hand, sports were always okay for men and like part of a kind of like heteronormative masculinity. You should play football and wrestle and do all these things. How and those were seen like in terms of that mind body connection as cultivating like good virtues in like a healthy boy, right? However, going to the gym had a very different cultural connotation, like well into the 1970s. The idea of going to a place to exercise, to going to a place with other scantily clad men to focus on. Um, a physical activity that was decidedly not intellectual or thought not to be intellectual, and that was very much about what you looked like, that assaulted all sorts of dominant ideas about what straight men were supposed to care about, right? A man who cared too much about what he looked like or taking care of his body in the 1950s, 60s, 70s was not a real man. And it's really amazing if you read women's magazines in the 1950s, when there, even the 60s really, when there was this cardiopulmonary scare, there was a boost in heart attacks because a lot of men who worked at desks and took the train were not active enough and they were getting heart attacks. And so these articles about men's health were targeted to women to say how to take care of your husband. And this is the most interesting part, how to take care of your husband without him knowing that he's not eating a real steak or that he's exercising. Because to do that, it wasn't just shameful to like be unhealthy. It was shameful to care about that and for a man, a straight man, right? And gym culture, and if you look at, I mean, a really vivid example of this is like Muscle Beach and a lot of the businesses that popped up around it in the 30s, 40s, 50s in um, the US, those guys um, were always being like um, seen as kind of, they call them perverts and kind of having a kind of questionable morality because they spent so much time exercising, you know, not in a lot of clothes, et cetera. Now, this as these two ideas that I mentioned become to really begin to really take hold in the United States, that starts to shift. And to be a man who goes to the gym just to work out starts to be something that is not just for gay men, um, but is a kind of hallmark of a kind of respectable, positive masculinity. I would say that takes longer than women. Like when you have women going to yoga jazzercise in the 70s, 80s, aerobics. You have aerobic studios in particular being a very important site in the 1980s for gay men and gyms as well, because during HIV AIDS, one of the shifts in body image around for gay men was that what's called the Chelsea boy look, like the big um, upper body. I'm glad you can all see me here as I model it. It's a big upper body and like the slim waist, but to be jacked, to be, to show that you had a vital body for gay men when HIV AIDS was seen as a wasting disease, 
was to display your health. So that's super important, but it doesn't do much to challenge the idea that gyms are gay spaces. And you can see this all over the media in this period, like, oh, this yoga studio, we have a couples class for women, but we always make sure to separate the woman, for women to bring their husbands, women to separate the woman and the man, because you know men are very uncomfortable in these spaces, particularly if they're women, if the women are better than them. So, you know, we tell the women to take it easy so that they can feel um, like excellent. That really changes, I would say, um, in the 90s as um, as fitness culture becomes more entrenched, in part, I would say, because yoga becomes very popular in the 1990s and yoga mainstreams a lot of these ideas and this language of self-actualization, enlightenment, holistic well-being. And so therefore, working out at the gym takes on this more um, lofty sensibility that's not just about getting big muscles and looking pretty or looking fit, but it's like about about taking care of your health in a way that is sort of more laudable. Um, a couple more words on that, just to put, put a really fine point. I will also say that in that same period, I think that the kind of gateway drug or gateway activity for straight men to have recreational fitness be considered a kind of positive thing is the rise of recreational running and then triathlon um and then triathlons and also cycling because and it's cycling spin which came out in the 1990s because all of those are sports this is not jazzercise right but that become kind of remade uh, for fitness context and then you start to see men making their way into these spaces straight men without feeling like this is some sort of like something they have to explain as not of a piece with a kind of conventional masculinity and there are tons of like um interesting ways to chart this one is i don't know in the wall street journal coined a phrase i think from some research report several years ago um um, the mammal, M-A-M-I-L, which is middle-aged man in Lycra. And that, that is a, yeah, that's a consumer segment. And it was interesting. I was out at Nike. Right. I was out at Nike interviewing people for this project. And I interviewed this guy who was like a performance technology expert who'd worked there maybe 25 years. And he was not like a cultural studies type. This is a guy like who looks at like the give and fabric and like works in this crazy lab with all this equipment to see how how the technology works. And I said, look, you've worked here for a long time. What's the biggest surprise you've seen or in, in demand or, or whatever? And he was like, if you had told me 25 years ago that men like, you know, like any guy would be wearing spandex to the gym, I would say like, no way, like men would never do that. And of course, some men did, dancers did. I would say many gay men in cities like were probably more okay with some of those choices around consumption, whether it's fashion or um, or going to a studio. But that is a really big shift. And I think you no longer see the think pieces that you would see even 10 years ago of like, why are there so many dudes in yoga class, right? And even there, the guys would be like, well, I'm there to pick up chicks. Now, like going to yoga is not something a man necessarily has to explain, right? It's, you know. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm, okay, but but in this time, in the same time period, we see a real change in terms of ideal body image, right? So, um, so I, I remember the, um, the all that research on the change in the GI Joe figures and the Barbie figures in terms of their um, waist, hip, and chest ratio, right? So, so like the GI Joe men got like so much bigger. So the ideal masculinity of the '50s, if we think of the, those movie stars of the '50s, they're not ripped at all, and now ideal movie star is like totally jacked right yeah that, and that's interesting and a lot of people trace that to the 1980s and all of those like terminator type movies with mm -hmm. starring arnold schwarzenegger by the way um but with these like big ripped muscular bodies i think there's no question that a fit body and we're talking about men now but they're yes. analogs for women that a fit body has become superior to a not fit body and and i i think that the conversation about the dad bod is like i don't even know exactly what it tells us but it is interesting that a dad bod is seen as non-normative enough that it's like worthy of comment like why would a celebrity have like a little gut you know or like not have like big shoulders they're not supposed to look like that but on the other hand that tends to be that term dad bod tends to be used in a kind of affectionate way that like never would happen with women no one's like oh look at her like cute little post baby punch like no yeah, yeah. so that, that that's not what the treatment women get so i think that speaks to um a real difference but i will say that um 
yeah, the point that you make about the 50s and the 60s, I would even say in the 70s is so uh, right. There's a um, an episode of the Jack Benny show, which is like an early 60s comedy series that I I was just watching and I'm quoting in my book where um, there's a young secretary in Jack Benny's office and he's like this businessman and it's probably his forties or something. And he walks in and he's like trying to pick her up and she's like, no, no, no. I like a man more like rock Hudson or she names some other like more muscular man. And so this old guy, not even old, but like, you know, business guy is like, I got to figure out what to do. And he's like, I heard there's something called a gym. And so he opens up this phone book and he's like, J I M. And like, he doesn't even know what it's called. And it's like, and then he goes and it's like a ridiculous scene for this guy. And he kind of decides like, well, I'm okay how I am. But it speaks to both like the beginning of the awareness that this is something changing, but also like, this is laughable, like no self-respecting person, maybe some silly young guy who's into his appearance. The last thing I'll say about male bodies, when I said I purposely was vague and saying a fit body has become sort of more desirable for men. There's this great article, I wish were longer, in Pacific Standard, rest in peace Pacific Standard, called How the Other Half Lifts by a man, and I now forget his name, but he talks about how like, yes, fitness has become more important, but that different fit bodies certainly convey a different class identity. And the big takeaway is basically that like the triathlete, triathlete, triathlete body at long, lean, expensive gear, the watches, all that totally speaks to a sort of white upper middle class or more or even more at least that uh, sensibility. It takes so long to train for these things like, you know, um, whereas the big jacked guy who lifts a lot still speaks to a kind of lower class um, body, right? The guy in the gym, the prison workout look like all, yeah. someone who uses their body for their work and that I thought was really interesting and he tells it through the story of like how he'd always been a distance runner and then he starts powerlifting and his body fundamentally changes but his wife also is like sort of disgusted with him in a not not classist way so you know like she like it's real it's really interesting it's like I wish that thing was a whole book but it's like 800 words but um yeah so I think that's also interesting to think about um and there are analogs like that to whip for women too I will say I do think part of our changes in gender norms, particularly around masculinity, um, have perhaps in good ways made performing or presenting in a variety of kind of male bodies more acceptable. Um, and I think it's great that a man who wants to go to jazzercise n doesn't have to like justify that in so many ways. On the other hand, like, you know, straight men were sort of insulated from a lot of the body pressures that, that women have long experienced for a long time. Like there was no, men in the 1950s with very, you know, small exception, didn't have men's health advertising six packs to them as something that they should even aspire to. And now they do. And that to me is a dubious, uh, you know, that is not like a great progress in, in that regard. So let's talk about money with this, because you bring up advertising and this segues us into, there is a ton of money flying around this industry. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, and the uh, certainly it costs money to go to CrossFit and to to join a gym. There are plenty of people who spend a lot of money at gyms and then don't go. There's all sorts of literature on, you know, why that is. Most um, yeah. Well, most people. Right. Um, although, in fact, one of my friends just recently told me, though, that he I don't know if it was a spin class or some exercise class. He is a member. He, he pays for this class. He signs up, but he gets charged extra if he doesn't come. Oh, really? Because there are so many people who are members and who sign up for like all the classes just to get spaces that then and then the classes were empty. And wow. so then they added like an extra financial commitment strategy where if you don't actually show up, even though you fully paid, you get further financially penalized. Um, so I thought, that, I thought that was kind of genius. Wisconsin? Is that a Wisconsin? Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll find out from I'll, I'll find out the details from him and send that to you. Because isn't that kind of interesting as like a double? Yes. Yeah. I've seen that happen. There's an app. I think it's called Gym Pact, maybe. And yeah. that if you don't show up, or if, yeah, if you don't show up or don't clock your miles or whatever, you have your credit card in there, and it sends money to charity. And people were joking, like you have to put like something you don't agree with, like the NRA or like exactly. pro life organization. Right. To make exactly. it. Um, but I do think like what great examples of the way we tie up commitment to fitness with virtue, right? 
so yeah, so if you can talk a little bit about that, but and then also about the, the money aspect of this here, because I mean, it going for a run theoretically would be free. I mean, not if you get by expensive sneakers and have all the gear and the tracking devices and stuff like that. But but now fitness has really moved into this idea of something that we really spend a tremendous amount of money on, um, and also the intersection of um, of uh, if you are not spending, like, is uh, what are the um, what what are sort of the virtues around spending money or not spending money? Okay, so much to say here. Yes. What a surprise, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> so one thing is, yeah, absolutely. Like the luxury end of fitness, particularly like I'm sitting here in New York City, like the luxury end of fitness that exists now in certain markets would have been, I think, unimaginable even 15 years ago. I remember when I moved to New York City, back to New York City in 2005, a uh, membership at Equinox, which is one of the fancier gyms here, was something like $180 a month, which I know in most markets in the US is still extremely high. But that seemed to me like astronomical in New York City to spend $180 a month on fitness. Yet within five years, those boutique fitness studios like SoulCycle and Barry's Bootcamp, now those are national chains, chains now, started charging like $35, $40 a class. And people were paying like, you know, $180 a week, if not more. Um, and so that ceiling is only rising in terms of like more luxury fitness and more willingness that people having more willingness to spend more money, more of their disposable income on fitness. Um, and to pause on that for one second, there was an interesting study that came out from some like cardlytics that was written up in the Wall Street Journal that showed that they were trying to track spending on boutique fitness, which is really the high end of this stuff. And they expected people to be cutting back on other leisure things, fancy vacations, bags. They were cutting back on gas and getting smaller cars in order to have more money to spend on fitness, which I think speaks to the way that the price points are rising. And some people do see this as more and more of a luxury, but also people are seeing this as more and more integral to who they are. And that to me is just fascinating. Okay, so that's happening. On the other hand, I think sometimes people like me who are like really exercised about the whole inequality aspect of things, like can fail to point out that the lower end is also booming as well. So the big gym, the gyms that are suffering are the middle tier ones, right? But you have Planet Fitness, Blink Fitness, all these places that are pretty low cost, not to mention the, all, the whole digital space, which creates opportunities for fitness in a, in a much more accessible way for a lot of people. Um, that said, I'm glad you started with that example of going for a run being like, but it's free. One of the things that I'm really attentive to, because that kind of inspo is so common in the fitness world, is you know, depending what neighborhood you live in, what body you exist in, who you have to take care of at home, like running is actually a very accessible in very accessible in extremely different degrees to um, different people, right? And that has, and that's not, doesn't even fall entirely neatly or, uh, along gender and class lines, although all of that is very relevant. When there was a runner a couple of years ago, a young woman who was murdered um, outside and some of the conservative commentary out was like, what the hell was she doing running alone outside? Like she should have been on a treadmill. Like what kind of woman goes out like and doesn't expect something bad to happen? That's been a real narrative. That's a continued danger for women runners that like people talk about all the time in the running sphere, not just getting murdered, but street harassment, etc. But then look also, black men have spoken about the danger. Like they're like, I'm not running through my neighborhood. People think I'm running from a crime. Like that that's not, that's something that, you know, to be a black man, running through the street is in our culture to evoke a kind of scrutiny that actually we know can be fatal, right? Not to mention, I, I love to pat myself on the back that I walk right outside and go two blocks down to the Hudson River and it's free and I'm just running in my city. Guess what? There's a reason why that part of the river in this more affluent neighborhood is totally built out and a public community space. Not the case in a lot of different neighborhoods. So I think that's something before we get too self-congratulatory or it's simplified to realize it in terms of the money to your original question. We have had this expansive boom in an industry in which the low end has been boosted up a lot. And in some cities, we've had an investment in green spaces and kind of free places to exercise. That is so 
not the same as an equally available free and a, you know robust public commitment to fitness and i think that's super important to to realize um something else though so that's like one side of this which i think is and super child important. care and, and like the ability to have child care for to okay. um, to work out i mean the number of times yeah. that i have had to just run around my house because I don't have I don't have any childcare. The kids are asleep, and I have to get some exercise of some sort. So what do I do? And it's so funny that there are a whole bunch. I mean, it's not funny. I, I feel you, right. and I, I applaud your commitment. Um, but I think that you know, there's a whole bunch of new high tech digital home fitness things that like build themselves as like, oh, in the modern age, we're so busy. I'm like, this is the oldest problem for women with children. You know what I mean? Like, this is what Jack Lalanne in the 1950s made his TV show on. You know, right. and so um, yeah, that's an ongoing thing. And then people with in other different, differently abled bodies, differently sized bodies. Yeah. Speak to anyone fat who goes to a gym and like getting there and the kind of, even the sort of well-meaning, good for you for getting started kind of, yeah, you know, like like, patting you on the head. right, patronizing behavior makes those kind of spaces far, spaces far less inviting for other people. The other thing I wanted to say though, and this speaks to like, why are people spending more on these, on these places? Why is this market growing? Um, that after 2008 the financial crash the, there has been surprising after, after i would say 2001 after 9-11 and then 2008 the fitness industry and especially the luxury end has only continued to boom how can this be one i think after 2001 this is there is both a kind of emphasis on that there are a lot of businesses that emphasize a sort of healing dimension of um, the healing dimension, the safety, the like when everything else out there is crazy, you can go inside. And there's like so there there was like an elevated sense that this is part of like healing work. There's also, that's when CrossFit is born. So there's also this rise in the kind of body is bunker and these militaristic, like post-apocalyptic, like you never know what's gonna happen, but at least you know that you could like run like hell if something happens. So that, both of those dimensions, I think escalate people's ability to and desire to spend. Then after 2008, and all this coincides with the rise of social media, by the way. So people are performing their participation in these spaces as well. After 2008, for a lot of people, even if they had money to spend, displaying their spending became distasteful on a lot of different things. Showing yourself on the hood of a fancy car or holding an expensive handbag or in a, on an island, not that people don't do that, for a lot of people who have some self-awareness, that's like not something that you can show off spending money on. However, showing yourself walking out of a spin studio, spending money on your health, even if, as if that health requires $100 leggings and a $40 class and a $10 juice, um, that takes on a different cast. And I think people have, there's been lots of very smart criticism of like that trend, but I think after 2008, spending on that, in uh, making that kind of expense is more, um, is is seen as more virtuous and more defensible than just plain luxury spending. This is a kind of work that you're doing and it's work on health and who's not behind health. And so that becomes, yeah. So the other, so we keep talking about the virtuous nature of it, which, um, and, um, and consuming happiness is cross-listed with religious studies. And the reason why this class in consumer science is cross-listed with religious studies, of course, is because there is such an overlap between our ideas about religion and our ideas about self-improvement, um, oh, yes. the good life, uh, what it means to be a good person, to have success, to, to be good in this life and then in the next. Now, so many people, I've seen so much um, criticism and, um, and discussion about the idea of the gym as um, and these these workout studios and yoga as a secular religion, right? As this the, and as, as people are moving away from organized religion, instead we are moving more toward psychology and then toward physical fitness. But really seeing these studios as um, the place where we go to worship. Totally, yeah. And I think the most reductive. Um form of that criticism is that the body becomes the temple. And this is like purely narcissistic, right? And that you see that in a lot of um, right wing or sort of conservative Christian critiques of yoga, right? That this is not only like vaguely Hindu, which is anti-Christian apparently, but it's also about sort of elevating the self above God. Um, and you see versions of that critique all over the place, even secular, secular versions that talk about 
secular critiques to talk about narcissism. I don't think people are wrong that the gym is becoming a new site of worship um, and not just in yoga, which is maybe sort of the most overtly or explicitly spiritual looks the spiritual, but not religious category, as you know, is like the most booming form of, of belief or quasi belief in um, the country and a lot of savvy fitness entrepreneurs, whether they're doing it deliberate, deliberately or not, are absolutely using spiritual language to, I think, both elevate the pursuit of what they're doing. Like this isn't just about your body. This is about um, enlightenment. This is about spiritual happiness. But also it's not just about the self because these are sites of community where people are coming together. Some of the only places Places, I would say, and this is perhaps my like rose colored lenses, but in a world in which almost everything is moving online and fitness is moving online as well. The gym, I think, is more of a holdout for an embodied collective activity. You know, don't get me wrong. These Some of these fitness companies like Peloton and others really are making huge strides, particularly for people who have to be home for certain reasons. There's no question about it that it's making that experience much more better, much more better, much better, and even approximating some of that community aspect. But I do think both because it's about physical work and because people get a lot out of that community, that re the regularity of community, that the gym continues to be a little bit more of a holdout in that regard. And that's not just my kind of cultural analysis I'm placing on it. There's real data there. One, um, anecdotally, if you look, um, this certainly happens all over New York, but in other places too, that different struggling retail businesses do these like pop-up workouts in retail spaces, sometimes in very unlikely spaces because they know that brings foot traffic, right? It's much harder to get someone to buy their kid's socks at a store. But if you have like a fun yoga class there, right? People actually come and you see this all over New York. There was a very unlikely combo of this. It was at Saks Fifth Avenue, I think. Um, and they had this prison workout, Con Body, which is founded by former, yeah, I know. I wrote but about like, it, obviously. Social class, and, I mean, like the, the, the oh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot okay, happening. Get over it, go ahead. You know, like a prison workout and ball gowns. I mean, okay, right, but yeah. But what I'm saying is that that's just one example. I mean, the one who really piloted this was Lululemon back in the day of having these free community classes in there. And everyone's like, oh, that's so great, free community classes. And they were, but you come in there, you buy clothes, right? And you're positively disposed towards the brand. So that happens. And then this is really interesting too, as our retail space has shifted and malls are dying, Gyms are one of the few anchor tenants that um, these places are going after. There was an interesting article in the New York Times about this, but it's far before that, um, you know, both because of the physical plant, like, you know, those big old department stores, which are dying right now, there isn't there aren't that many businesses that need that much square footage. Gyms do. And then, too, we've talked about virtue. You get that hit of feeling good. You're going to walk out and be like, I need a cute top or I want to buy myself like a yummy snack or something. So all of that kind of comes together there. So, yeah, I think that's a, an important part of this as well and speaks to the new we talked we're talking about religion, but it speaks to the kind of um, community building dimension of this. It's also worth saying like jazzercise and a lot of these like early dance formats that didn't really fit neatly in what were like very like bodybuilding type gyms in the 70s and 80s. A lot of them are happening in like church basements, which is really funny yeah. because those spaces literally didn't exist yet. So the um, so. Oh man, I could talk about all these things with Me you. For like, oh God, we're like running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. Let's see. Um, I, I think the. Um, oh, there's so many so many different ways. So do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about yoga? Because we haven't because you have a whole book coming out about yoga and well, and it's a big part of it, but, but yeah, so it's funny. And I think the last time I talked about this work or the last time I came to our yeah. actual, we talked about yoga. So to me, yoga is so important in the U S because it does a lot of work in kind of moving fitness from this purely physical pursuit to, um, investing it with this language, uh, that's much loftier. Like I said, self-improvement and actualization and spirituality and community and all of that. And, um, and it becomes a huge business as well. And to me, yoga, like 
I mean, I can speak about how that happens. Yoga, when it comes to the United States in the late 1890s, is not does not come as a physical practice. Like when Vivekananda comes to the to the World's Fair, he's there to talk about Eastern spirituality. He gets a position in um, Eastern religions at Harvard. He gives lectures. Like this is about the uh, relig religious teaching, um, even from a scholarly perspective. And the asana or the physical movements are distinct from that. Now in India and in, in England, there already was a kind of calisthenics movement that was that was merging um, with with yoga. That picks up in the U.S. aside from some sort of celebrity like experimenter types in the 1950s or so. It really picks up after 1965, the Immigration Act that opens the U.S. doors to South Asian immigration. And so you have a lot more Indians coming, a lot more interest, particularly in the counterculture in different forms of Eastern things like and this is acupuncture this is chinese medicine this is yoga and it becomes actually um even though there were people who were doing yoga as exercise like in devi in the united states it becomes actually a way that more countercultural people kind of get into what becomes a coherent fitness culture in a way that feels so different from going to like lift weights or go to a slenderized salon, right? But by the 1990s, um, and I think this has to do in some ways with the close of the Cold War, the rise of multicultural sensibilities in the US, um, yoga becomes much more popularly accessible and embraced. And, and I have, I got the receipts to prove this, you have all of these um, fusions and collaborations between prominent yogis and like gym entrepreneurs who are looking for the next best thing. Y the yoga community, to the extent it's one thing, which it isn't, is deeply divided about this. On the, there are these debates in the pages of Yoga Journal, which is like on the one hand, like yes, we are shedding this cloud of mysticism, which has like made us weird and considered to be like this religious practice. And then other people like, oh, before long, we're gonna be like a stretching program before sports events and in the military. And it's kind of still both, but I would say it's almost more of the latter for most American, um, for most Americans. So yeah, that's kind of the story of yoga, and I, I would say. And now we see the influence of yoga all over um, all sorts of fitness formats, and largely destigmatized. Aside from I think some conservative Christian critics, um, largely destigmatized as this like weird out there, um, you know, countercultural, strange phenomenon. Well, I think it, it, so with, with both, with yoga and CrossFit and all of these sort of, the, the, first of all, the history of all these exercise programs is really interesting. The way it overlaps with the consumer culture is super interesting. And then, but this idea of embodying um, in a, in a community context, I think also can't be underestimated, right? Okay. Because as our culture has moved more toward individuals and more online, right? There's of course the fear that we're going to get isolated as individuals digitally trying to improve ourselves, you know, all the self-help is trying to go on in, into apps and things like that. And yet, really, what you're studying is is something that is um, that is by its nature embodied and not digital. You know, even if the way of even if the way of, of giving the information may be moving more digital, right? It's an embodied thing, and the community aspect of it is so strong. And to me, you know, as we to me, that seems like a really important thing not to lose. Yeah, and, oh, totally. and a, a huge benefit of um, fitness as a um, a consuming happiness product is that it is embodied and that it does have community, and it sort of challenges this individualistic nature, even though it's about improving the self. I know totally, and I think that community aspect is so important. But then, as like I remind myself, I also live in a very densely populated city where there are probably three gyms that are within two blocks of like any where I work or where I live, or you know, and and there's actually one in this office building right now. Um, and so I think it's good that we have this proliferation of home, um, you know, and digital opportunities. But yeah, I do think that there that the gym is this sort of tenacious, more tenacious holdout than other things we spend money on, um, even as the digital world has, for some very good reasons and with some good results, been making inroads into that space as well.
Right. So to me, that really gives hope. Um, and, um, and that's my positive spin on this, that I think this really could be um, where, uh, where how we can continue to consume happiness, not in isolation, yeah. but in a collective way, which, of course, and we don't have time to talk about this, but a, a subject that you and I are both really passionate about is making all of this not only about the individual, but about social justice and coming together and collective action. And so really bringing people together in a space like that seems like much more of the fodder for potential collective action. Totally. Rather. I think, though, we have to be, and this is like, again, another conversation, but like also like access is one thing, right? Yes. But then it's also for all the reasons we began this conversation about like, and then what goes on in those spaces? Is it social justice to be like, you too can come to the slenderizing salon. You no. too should be right. stressed out about having a six pack and should add like this abs class to your day. Not really. So I think, I mean, I, as someone who teaches fitness and is like a total gym rat, I think there's such magic that can go on in the gym, but I also see such crappy, damaging, like awful stuff as well. And so I think that sometimes the conversation, which should be sort of up here about access and inclusivity, while well, it's very well placed, like we got to create access and then think like access to what, right? And like, what's the best that this industry and this field has to offer? And how do we get it out there as opposed to how do we promote something which is not all that great and maybe shouldn't even be <laughs> what it is? Oh, this is so interesting. Thank you so much Thank for taking you. the time to chat with me about this. Um, oh, and pleasure. This is just, oh, I mean, really, I, I could talk to you forever about this. And I can't wait. When is your book coming out? Oh my God, don't say it. Um, and it should come out next year, but I, you know, I'm teaching a, an entire lecture course based on the book next semester, and I have a meeting about making it digitally available online, so working on that. Really? Oh, well, that would be, that would be wonderful, because I would imagine that many of my students and, um, and alums of Consuming Happiness would be very interested in following this well, one. I, stay tuned, you know. Yay! All right. right, thank you. It's okay. wonderful to see you as always. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.